we can start. Okay. You just uh, let me introduce uh, Anthony, the uh, associate professor of the Laughing Ranta University. And uh, earlier he was the academic master of the University of Hilton. So it's going to be talking about probabilistic returns and extrapolation. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so what we're basically going to do here is we'll take a very classical numerical method called Richardson extrapolation and plug in some Gaussian processes and obtain what we like to call probabilistic Richardson extrapolation method out of that. So let me start with uh, just some context around the paper. So this is a joint work with a bunch of people from the UK. So the main idea came from Chris, who's a professor in statistics in Newcastle University. And then Aritha, who's I think reader in Edinburgh, and me were doing various things, theory and so on. And then at the end, I will showcase a case study in of using this me this methodology in. Uh, are we getting coffee? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I will showcase a case study of using this methodology in cardiac modeling. So we had some real cardiac models that Marina and Steven are working on, and this. Uh, this work was recently accepted to JRFSP. And well, there's a couple of a few, few other papers on, on very similar topic, which some of, some of which we only found out about while we were after we had written our paper. So first of all, we have one kind of a preliminary paper published in New York seven years ago with slightly different set of authors. And, and, and then there are two other papers with Quite similar ideas, but slightly different models. They don't have theory, they have different experiments and so on. But uh, I think clearly, this, this kind of idea is not something that only we've come up with. Isn't it? I think this kind of ties up to this general trend of using, using multi fidelity models and doing probabilistic versions of multi fidelity modeling and so on. So, to start with, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to classical Richardson extrapolation. So this is very classical stuff. I think this was this was invented maybe in the twenties or something like that. So this is this is very standard for numerical analysis people, I think. So what we have here is do you have this kind of a nice stick here? No. Okay. Well. Uh, so what we have here is we have some function f of h which is and some kind of estimate or approximation which determines, which uh, uh, is determined or depends on a discretized system parameter h. So this fh could, for, for example, represent the uh, solution that a differential equation solver outputs when you use some discretized system parameter h. Or for example, if you are doing numerical integration, you could, so you have some function, and you try to compute the integral over this uh, interval. So this H could represent the uh, spacing between different points at which you evaluate your function in order to compute its integral. And now if your numerical method is somehow consistent in the sense that as H goes to zero, you actually converge to the true quantity of interest. We can say that H zero actually represents the solution of the differential equation or the integral of your unknown function. And in many cases, if we know something about our method and, uh, and the problem that the method is trying to solve, we can derive some kind of order of convergence for the method. So that when h goes to zero, the error, so the true quantity minus the approximation goes to zero with some uh, polynomial rate h to r. So if we have something like this, which in many cases we do, we can use Richardson extrapolation, which works like this. So we compute uh, the approximation at the at a number of different uh, discretization parameters. So we have so if now this plot represents the function f. So here at f zero would be the true quantity of interest. And for positive H, we get some, we have some approximation. 
So what we do here is we take a bunch of discretized systems, hx1, hx2, hx3, hx4, and so on, and uh, uh, run our numerical method on this, this uh, with these discretized system parameters. Then we can uh, uh, form a certain polynomial interpolant. So this is a certain polynomial which uh, constructed in a certain way, which passes through these points. And now the value, value of this polynomial at the origin gives us an approximation of the true quantity of interest. And there is class, classical theory which says that if your method has this order of con convergence and you do this kind of a polynomial extrapolation, then you get a new method which converges with an improved rate. So whereas the original method converges with rate r, we now have rate h to r plus n minus one. So yeah, so I think this, this is the thing you can have in as large as you want. So I'm actually making a kind of kind of a infinite smoothness assumption here. So typically there is you have this kind of expansion only up to some order. So you then you can get get this small n up to that order. And so now you, you, what this is saying that if you take around your digital safe at these points and scale all the points towards the origin, then you get this rate of convergence. So let me I have a picture about this. So this is not exactly the same method, but the principle is, is the same. So here you're running your numerical method at with four different digitization parameters. And then you can form this kind of a linear fit. And then this point here would be your approximation to the true quantity of interest. But of course, you can take, go to higher orders, to quadratic fit, cubic fit, and so on. And in this particular case, you, you can see that if you, if you go to higher orders, you get a better fit. And uh, to actually to give an actual convergence example, we can take a look at the classical trapezoidal rule. So this is just if I have a function that I want to integrate, I can approximate it by using these uh, this nice rectangles. And there is some classical theory which says that if my if your if the function that you're trying to integrate is twice differentiable then your trapezoidal rule convergence with uh, the rate h to h to power two, which means that we can take this stuff, plug in two for r, and construct uh, a Ricardson method for numerical integrals. And in this case, we see that the standard trapezoidal rule converges with rate h to h to two, whereas if you do this Ricardson with Two points, you get improved rate. Here, this uh, oscillation looks a bit weird, but that just comes from the fact that uh, when, when I'm placing these integration points, the sets of integration points are not nested. So I, I always use spacing H, which means that I will not have nested integration points. And there was some particular function that I applied. Just, I don't remember what it was. Probably something with sinusoids. Yes, yeah, so what we want to do is we want to replace this polynomial extrapolation with Gaussian process extrapolation. So in, in the simplest of terms, we just want to fit a different kind of curve and extrapolate. But if you want to be fancy, you can call it Gaussian process regression. And of course, from Gaussian process regression, because you will be working in this kind of probabilistic setting, you can use all the, all the tools and methods of probability theory to do all kinds of other things that I will showcase later. Okay, so let's go to GPs. I, I suppose most people here have some familiarity with GPs, but yeah, let me just, I think I have time, so I can introduce them briefly. So a GP, which I'm going to denote FGP, is a stochastic process, which is, which has, which is defined by the fact that it has uh, Gaussian joint distribution. So if I evaluate this process at any number of points, the resulting random vector is going to have Gaussian distribution. And in this case, I'm going to use zero mean GP, which means that the vector will have 
uh, mean zero, and my GP is going to have positive definite covariance kernel K, which is a certain function, which a certain kind of function which defines the covariance structure of my GP. And the main thing here is that one, uh, qualitative properties of this covariance, covariance kernel determine what my Gaussian process looks like. So here I have four different covariance kernels and samples from the resulting Gaussian processes. So here I have a infinitely smooth kernel. So you can differentiate this covariance kernel how many times you want. And that's, that means that any sample I draw from the corresponding GP is going to be infinitely differentiable. But if I take something which is not differentiable, if you try to differentiate this guy when x and y are zero, you cannot do that. I get something which looks very much like Brownian motion. And then I can have all things, all, all things in between. For example, this guy is once integrated Brownian motion, which means that these paths are exactly once differentiable. And you can see that they look perhaps a bit rougher than these infinite differentiable paths over here. And then I have a lot, a lot of other trades. And the nice thing about GP regression is that you can do everything in closed form by a very simple linear algebra. So how you proceed is that you, in, in, in this particular case, so we take, we compute our, we run a numerical method a number of, with number of different dissertations, x1 to xn. We think of this resulting vector as our data vector. And we condition the GP prior FGP on this data. This means that we will get a new GP which uh, uh, which has samples which pass through these data points. So if I do it here, I get uh, samples from a, my GP samples are going to look like something like this that they pass through all these all these data points. And this resulting posterior process has a mean function and a covariance kernel which are available by a relatively simple linear algebra. You just need to solve a linear system equation, which of course, if your data set is huge, will present a problem. But in this particular case, that's not a problem at all because we typically have only at most 10 data points. So here it's not a problem at all. And uh, this posterior mean is supposed to give you some kind of point estimator at points at which you haven't ob observed your uh, underlying function yet. And this variant is supposed to somehow tell you how uncertain you are. So if we look at the illustration, so here we have, uh, so the black dots are our data points and the blue curve is the posterior mean function. And this blue shaded region is the 95% credible interval around the, around the mean. So the Gaussian process model is somehow saying that with probability 95%, you will find the true function in this region. At each point. And now when I get more, more data, I see that my posterior mean changes. It's always passing through the data points, and that my answer that the region is shrinking. But of course, it could be that this, this black curve was what actually produced the data. So which in this case would mean that okay, here you are probably doing quite well because the true function is at least almost within this uh, credible region, but here it's just completely off. So uh, typically it's quite important. Uh, or to typically uh, you want your Gaussian process model to be somehow well specified that you want it to encode correct properties. For example, if your process says that your function is in some sense infinitely differentiable, then you may get a way too small answer to the region if your function is not infinitely differentiable and so on. And then typically, as I say, say in the title, people do this, they, people, when people do this, they want to interpolate. So they want to use this posterior mean to predict the value of the underlying function between any two points. But what we are going to do is we're going to extrapolate. So we are going to be basically looking at uh, here. We're going to, going to be looking at what, what kind of information about these data give us about the value of the underlying function, which is our numerical method, uh, give us, uh, at h equals zero. And now, perhaps you recall from this uh, very first slide about the Richardson extrapolation that uh, 
in those methods, you have to know what the order of convergence is in order to construct this correct polynomial interpol uh, polynomial uh, interpolant and extrapolate. And the same thing holds true in a Gaussian process setting. So we're going to construct a, sp a specific kind of a Gaussian process model, which encodes the fact that the numerical method converges with some rate. And how we are going to do it is like this. So I'm also always going to work on the unit cube because that's the easiest. So now we're in the dimension D, which means that you can have multiple different discretization parameters. So you can have time discretization, spatial discretization, let's say along different axes and so on. And we take a, a function B, which is positive and zero only at the origin. So this function B is going to model how fast we think the numerical method converges. And then we take some uh, covariance term, KE, which is somehow modeling how nice, how nicely this convergence happens in some in, in the sense of how smooth the approximation process is as a function of the discretization parameter. Uh, KE, I you mean this C here? Yeah. I don't actually remember. Maybe, but it's, yeah, I really don't remember. There must have been some reason for it, but it, it also could be just arbitrary. But the, the, the point of this part is just to encode some kind of smoothness. Yeah. So we can look at it, what happens here. So here I use, so this B encoded the rate of conversion. So here the rate of conversion is very slow, just linear. And here, here is a bunch of samples drawn from the corresponding GP. But now when I increase the rate of convergence, you see that the samples, they go to zero much faster. So that's the point of this uh, function B here. And finally, I, we also include this constant term here, because if we did not have this constant term, that would mean that all the samples from the GP were, were zero at the origin which would imply that the method thinks that the true quantity of interest is zero, which of course doesn't make any sense. So we have to include this constant term in order to get rid of that kind of behavior. And we will later on basically remove this constant term by sending this constant C zero to infinity, which corresponds to kind of using a, some kind of Jeff Jeffrey's prior or uninformative prior. But we, we, we do that only after we've conditioned on the data, because if we do that, did that before, then this model would wouldn't make any sense. You would, you would just have infinite variance everywhere. So after we take this kind of a model, we can apply this general GP method methodology to our extrapolation problem. So we have uh, values of the uh, our outputs of the numerical method at different digitization as our data. We condition our GP prior with this particular form of kernel on this data. And third, we take this objective prior after conditioning. So we let this constant C0 go infinity. And then we also use some. So here we have this parameter sigma. So this controls how much variance there is. So in order to get some meaningful variance, we need to select the sigma based in some data-driven way. So we come up with some, or use some standard techniques to select this, this uh, parameter. And what, what, what this gives us is this extrapolation for the uh, unknown quantity of interest. So this is just the value of my posterior mean function at the origin. So when you do all this thing, you can actually compute that it's quite, quite simple. So this one is just vector of ones. KB is the discoverance matrix you, using uh, formed out of this, uh, out of this uh, kernel that we're using based on these data points. And this KN F00 is trying to tell us how uncertain we are. So let's take a look at a couple of pictures. So here's the first picture. So here we have uh, how many? We have five data points. And this, I think this is a very bad picture. I should do something else. So this uh, dashed line is the posterior mean. And these uh, dotted things give the answer to the region. So in this case, they give the standard deviation at the points. And in this case, we see that there is, so this star is the, the true quantity of interest. So in this case, we see that the method is actually doing quite well. It, it uh, 
gives an approximation or estimate of the true quantity of interest, which is quite accurate. And moreover, this true quantity of interest seems to be uh, falls within this uh, credible region in this case. Here the x-axis is h. Yeah, I mean it's h times x. No, no, so, so it's x. It's x. So this. Uh, yeah, I think this is sometimes a notation a bit difficult. So here, I mean, each of those these points they just correspond to. If I removed h here altogether, mm. so you can just think of them as basically different discretization parameters. Yeah, it's it's a bit. Scale is really not like like one looks like the larger discretization that leads to that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, you, you can kind of always think of that you're. Not like, like... Yeah, you can always, yeah, but then you can always just uh, normalize everything to this. But yeah, yeah, your point is very good one in the sense that here we have, I have this, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to you know, use H for some digitalization parameter. But then often in theory, you need to have H times some Xs. So, so it becomes a bit muddled sometimes. But here the X axis just represent some digitalization parameters or parameter in this case. And here's another example. So the purpose of this example is to just show what happens when you use different kind of Gaussian process. So here we have, uh, again, okay, now, now, now it's H. So th this X and H are, they have exactly the same function. Uh, yeah, so the purpose, purpose here is to demonstrate what happens when you change your model. So again, we are looking at the, so these stars are the uh, true quantities of interest. And on the left, we are using for this KE, KE which tries to quant quantify somehow the smoothness of your uh, approximation. This KE is something called material one half, which is which is very rough, which which, have, which assumes that the approximation process is very rough, which means that these uncertainty regions are very large. But when you increase the smooth, assume smoothness. So here you are assuming here you are making no differentiability assumptions. Here you assume that the approximation process is once differential. And here you assume it's infinitely differential. And at least between these two, you can clearly see that the, the uncertainty regions shrink, shrink, which is completely natural because you're in these pictures, you're making much, much stronger assumptions about the underlying process than you are in the first one. And now I'm going to move to a bit of theory. So this gives, so again, on the on the very first slide, I had this classical convergence result, improved convergence result for classical Ricardson extrapolation. And we have a in spirit similar result for this Gaussian process thing. So what this is basically saying is that if I have this function Ke, or this covariance Ke has certain smoothness parameters by S, so the larger S is, the stronger your assumptions are. And if I, if the function B, which models the rate of convergence, is a polynomial of degree R, then I can prove that my extrapolation error is some constant, this is basically just a constant times magnitude of this B times H to, to S. And if I select, if I go to dimension one and select this particular polynomial that we saw earlier, then this bound becomes H to R plus S. So here R is the kind of assumed rate of conversion of the method. And so it's the same thing that we had in the, for the classical Cartesian method. And S is the extra term that we get from inserting some smoothness assumptions via Gaussian process regression. So this is basically saying that under certain assumptions, and if this approximation process is S times differentiable, then you can get uh, S extra orders of convergence. This logic you want to take as, as large as possible or as small? Yes, you want as large as possible, but- But then we saw that it- uh... Yes, yeah, so at some point it may be that you know, your assumptions no longer hold. Yeah, so this comes from the fact that, so this F is the, 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 the approximation process. So we assume that it's in this certain uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is basically a space of 
uh, S times differentiable functions. Technically, it's usually a suballoy space, but that's close enough. Yeah, so if you put uh, too large, too large on R, R, this theorem no longer holds. And we can, and in, in practice, you get, in practice, you get kind of a saturation that if you use, if you use a method which assumes too much smoothness, the rate of convergence you get is the, is capped by the true smoothness of F. So if you use, if you assume more smoothness, then you don't get any improvement. It's just a kind of maxes out. And you, we can see it in these figures soon. Maybe, maybe actually, actually let's, let's take a look at this figure now because we started talking about it. So here I have, uh, I have this trapezoidal rule example where this kind of unscaled, unscaled, uh, uh, this perfection parameters are one to uh, two to minus four. So when we look at this convergence here, we are looking at what happens when h goes to zero and you're you're running the numerical method at h, h to two minus one. Like this. And that, that's what these plots are showing. And we can see here this kind of saturation behavior that you don't improve, that you don't get any extra improvement after some point. So these uh, blue things are diff these different modern kernels which encode different smoothnesses. So in particular, if you use this uh, order S0, so you don't assume any smoothness, you get convergence like this over here. But if you put uh, some smoothness there, you get convergence, which is slightly faster. And if you could put twice, uh, twice differentiability, then you get even faster convergence. However, if you go to this S equals infinity case, you don't get really, you get slightly better. It could be that the rate is also slightly better. It's difficult to say, but you don't gain much. So there is clearly some kind of saturation going on. But what, you, what happens if you use too much uh, smoothness is that, so this plot here uh, is somehow trying to quantify how how good your uncertainty quantification is. In the sense that if, if we have large values here, that means that these uncertainty regions are much smaller than the true error, which means that the method is somehow overconfident. It's saying that the error is small while it isn't in reality. So in this case, what happens is that for this very smooth kernel under these very smooth assumptions, they get this really overconfident uncertainty quantification. I don't know what's happening here. It's not going to. Uh, so this, and actually no. So this Wendland is just a different type of kernel which has a uh, particular smoothness. Yeah. So it's in this case, it's roughly speaking analogous to this matter with S1 is basically the same thing as when does this do with S1 and so on? And I think we can, yes, we can kind of see it even here. So this is this is modern with S1, and the other one is Wendland with, with S1. And they're basically the same. And here, okay, there is some difference, but I think the rates are more or less the same. And then these Shanks, Germain, Born, and TL, they are some classical extrapolation methods, somehow related to Ricardson. But now we went to the under the quantification. So let me show the previous slide. So we can so uh, we can obtain some kind of a result about under the quantification if we use certain kind of estimator for this scaling part of the sigma. So under certain assumptions, we can show that this particular limb soup is not is finite. So what this is saying is that so this F0 minus MNH at zero is the true, true extrapolation error. So F is the true quantity of interest and this is the extrapolation. Whereas this stuff in the denominator is, uh, so if you formed, uh, so this is, this is a standard, posterior standard deviation at the origin. So if you form some confidence interval, that, that, that confidence interval is just going to be this guy times some constant. So what this is now saying is that if this, if this ratio is finite, 
as h goes to zero, that means that the standard deviation does not blow up faster than the true error, which means that there is some confidence level for which uh, eventually, uh, uh, so, so that the, that the uh, true quantity of interest will be eventually contained in the corresponding confidence interval. It's a rather weak statement, but at least it somehow says that your under certain assumptions, your method is not going to be catastrophically overconfident. Okay, so we have this figure, and then I have another figure which is very similar. So here we again see this kind of a saturation behavior that if you put a lot of smoothness, so this uh, yellow line, you don't really gain that much. And again, but if you put a lot of smoothness, you, your answer to quantification may be completely off. So in this case, all these, for all these other methods, this ratio that I was talking about appears to be conversion to zero. Whereas for this very smooth case, you should get them something really weird. It might be blowing up, it's difficult to say. Okay, and perhaps the, at least for the future, perhaps the most interesting thing about this is that because we are in this Gaussian process framework, we can do all kinds of probabilistic extensions very naturally. So for example, I, uh, until now I've been assuming that this function B, which models the rate of convergence is fixed. But of course, in reality, if you are doing some, let's say, if your numerical method is some complicated finite element solver and so on, you don't really know what the rate of convergence is, but you can estimate that from the data. Let's say you can construct the maximum likelihood estimator for this parameter R and try to use that. Now, in practice, that's probably going to be quite difficult because your the amount of data you have is not too large, but it, it, may, it may work in some cases. And moreover, you can easily do, at least in principle, of course, in practice, it's always a bit of a hassle, to do multidimensional output. So we can we can think of, let's say, instead of just single F0, we can think of our the quantity that we're trying to approximate being F0 T or T at some uh, discrete index set. So this would be, say, the value of a differential equation at a number of different points. And finally, which I find perhaps the most, most, most interesting, so also perhaps the most difficult of this, we can try to do optimal experimental design. So if we have some computational budget, capital C, and we have some set of candidate simulations. So we have basically a set of different discretization parameters at which we, that we can use. We can try to uh, find out which discretization parameters are the best by maximizing this quantity, which is, this is actually just one over the posterior variance of our method which means that when you try to maximize this guy, you minimize the posterior variance under the constraint that the sum of the computa computational budgets at, at these digitalization points does not exceed this computational budget. Of course, in practice, this is going to be difficult because you don't really know what the computational cost, what the computational cost of running some complicated finite element solver is going to be. But uh, in some cases, you can probably do something here. So I'm going to just show a very simple example of this experimental design here. So what I'm assuming here is that bx is x, which means that my this method has a linear rate of convergence. And then I'm assuming that c of x is 1 over x. So c is the cost of running this method. So the cost scales uh, has inverse scaling to their discretization parameter. And in this case, when I tried to do this experiment, or when I went did this experimental design, he found out that if I take this mot one half kernel, which encodes no smoothness assumptions, uh, you, what you get is that all your computational budget is spent on the, or you, you select a digitalization parameter that's as small as possible within your computational budget. So what this means is that because this kernel, because it assumes that the process is not differentiable, it's not, uh, that, that means that basically the value of the process at two different points is basically independent, which means that you get no extra information. 
and which in this case means that it's best just to use the smallest possible disk data sets. And sometimes you see this extra, extra uh, disk data sets appear here. So that's just because you had, we had to discretize the set of candidate points. And sometimes there was slight, some computational budget left and that was spent over there. But the situation is very different when you use this infinite smoothness assumption. So now, now all the points are very, very strongly correlated. And when you run the optimization, you actually notice that the best possible points are not the ones with the, with the smallest possible distribution parameter given the budget, but something else, which is uh, positively surprising. Or maybe not surprising, but it's very nice. And for I don't recall if we had pictures for some intermediate values. So presumably, if you took, if you say assumed once differentiability, you would get kind of something like this, but probably a bit shifted towards left. But again, in practice, you will encounter some difficulties because you don't you don't know what the computational costs are going to be. But you can try to do something. So we had this uh, case study of applying this, this methodology to uh, cardiac modeling. So this is a case study in the sense that we have nothing, nothing that you could use off the shelf. This required a lot of hand tuning and kind of cheating, uh, cheating at some points. So for example, when we were when we were doing this optimization here, what we actually did is we run our so this involved some uh, finite element computations. So we run the FEM solver with a bunch of different digitization parameters as, and afterwards use those as the candidate set for doing this uh, optimization here. Because, uh, because we have no idea how, how costly, the, costly, costly, the, costly running the solver would be. So we have to basically uh, pre-do it for a bunch of, uh, bunch of values and see how long it took. Yeah, so there is some kind of a complicated PD model of a beating human human heart, and in this case, the digitization controls the mesh size because you need to solve this differential equation using the finite elements. The digitization parameter controls the mesh size in the finite element method, and uh, we were actually able to get something reasonable out of this. So what we have here is, is uh, so this, is, this shows some kind of, I think these are like volumes of certain parts of the human heart and how they are changing over time. So this D is not a discretization parameter anymore. So what we have is we have this so-called FAX hi phi, which is kind of the solution of this, this differential equations with a very small discretization parameter. So that's kind of the ground rules because of course we cannot solve anything analytically. But in practice, no, no practice, practice uh, no, no one who's actually doing this method would use this small discretization parameter because it just takes too much time. But we could use it as a kind of a, uh, for validation purposes. And then, then we run our, run this, run this, uh, this uh, FEM solvers with, uh, bunch of different uh, discretization parameters, which were always larger than kind of this default parameter that a practitioner would use. And then, then we, then we use, use our method. And what we noticed in this case was that doing this give, gave better approximations to the solution of the PD than just running the solver with this default discretization. So, in this case, there might be actually something to gain. Of course, this required a lot of hand tuning and kind of, because we were doing this experimental design thing, it also required us all kinds of pre-computations of computational costs and stuff like that, which of course you can, cannot or, or you can, but you probably don't want to do in practice. So there's much, much more to be done there. But in principle, it seems that this kind of methodology can work. It seems, and it also seems my timing was quite good. We are, it's 45 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah good. Yes, I think I'll stop here.
Yeah, so that's something I completely glossed over here. But in this in this uh, case study, we actually fitted. We I think it was maximum likelihood that we used to fit the length scale parameters. Sorry. That works like well, yeah, I think in the, we 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 were able to get it to work. But in practice, it, in many cases, it probably can be difficult to because you have so you have, as you said, you have so little data that it it it. it it can be challenging. Of course, in many cases, if you have, I don't know, four data points in dimension one, that may be already enough to see that at least rule out some very unrealistic values of the length scale. Yeah, maybe a bit more general thing that I was thinking about. Like, is there anyone in probabilistic numerics using two keys, but then actually properly integrate not have a problem so that we can see? I think not many people do that because it's, but he, here, here that might make, make Yes, yes. So here, here, here it might make sense. And because here also the computational cost is really dominated by the cost of running your numerical method. Yes, so here, here it, I, I completely agree that that might be something that we should do. I think we didn't do that now. I, th I think we didn't do it. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to say for me to say if it would make sense to do it or if you could actually gain something from doing it, but but definitely it could be, it's, it's something that's potentially useful and feasible here. Interesting, and I'm trying to think if uh, what if now your uh, so the differential equation you're solving now is not uh, deterministic anymore. Now it's a if it's a probabilistic uh, model that you're trying to estimate. Yes. And uh, let me see where my question is going. So, so basically. So so now it's not an extrapolation task, but let's say you're trying to learn. Uh, some uh, underlying parameters of this uh, process or this uh, yes like you you have a model a simulator that uh, you know solves some differential equations and maybe there's some uncertainty somewhere some uh, random numbers and then it outputs you know let's say uh, functions yes and then now you're trying to learn the underlying parameters of that particular model but now this running that uh, simulator is actually very very costly would this uh, method be applicable for kind of uh, trying to find at what discretization parameter should I run? So it's kind of like the optimal experimental design that you did, but now for the task of not extrapolation to one particular point, but trying to learn the underlying parameters of that. Uh, I, I would expect that it's possible to do that. So I guess it, like on a very general level, it would somehow you would have some kind of optimization problem, which yeah. would, but your objective would be just something somehow related to your parameter estimation problem. Yes, yes. Yeah. Or something, yeah. Or maybe a combination of. Yes, uh, yeah. So somehow more complicated anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I, Especially I, if now you want to also learn the cost function. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes, that's I, kind of I, where I was uh, thinking because, I think uh, it's, because in many fields you have these very complicated models that. You know, if it takes hours to get one data point, it's you cannot do any of these uh, yes. you know, like yes. uh, probabilistic inference methods or simulation based inference methods. So you're using to kind of optimize not only at what simulator runs you do, so which is what yes. parameters should I run, but also now uh, combine that with the discretization parameter. Yes, 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 I, I completely agree. Uh, I think that might, might be interesting. I think when we were when we were discussing this paper with some other people, I was visiting the University of Newcastle last year. I think someone said something about this stochastic or like a stochastic 
okay, so stochastic, stochastic differential equation, but I don't know if anything about that ended up in the paper in the end. And I don't recall what we actually discussed, but it definitely wasn't wasn't exactly this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I didn't go into too much details for what the model is, but I guess it, it is solving some differential equation inside it and then doing maybe other things also. Yes. Uh, so it, it's not just trying to optimize where to run the model, but also you know combine that with this approach. Yes. Might have additional gains. Perhaps, perhaps you can get some, I don't know, you can somehow combine answers to the quantification from what you get from here to some other sources of uncertainty. Yeah. Because in practice, the calibration of like how much uncertainty that you get from different sources is probably quite difficult. Because I think there's like Bayesian optimization based on that. So you try to, let's say, compute, uh, minimize some distance between your data and uh, you know your model, and then you to run the model in different yeah so like somehow at optimal optimal query points or something sorry yeah like, like some, at, at, in some sense optimal query points or something like that yeah yeah i mean in that sense this is kind of it's of experimental design thing here is kind of similar yeah and i suppose you could do this more sequentially like you typically do in Bayesian optimization that you always just optimize the next different assessment point not all of them simultaneously here you assume that C of X is known, right? Yes, or you have somehow access to it, which is, of course, completely unrealistic. And at least in realistic applications. Maybe you have some idea of, like, of, of its magnitude, or like, let's say, of, you, you may have some idea of its asymptotics, but yeah, that's like probably not enough for this. Yeah, like something like that. that. I think it typically knowing what that is is going to be difficult. Do, do we need to? Uh, can we set up? We have a lecture. Ah, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, we can continue. Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's thank our speaker again. Okay.